Uh, the gentleman in the photograph is holding a red-tailed hawk. Uh, he's Chris Stroop, who's the director uh, of our wildlife clinic. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to turn the evening over to Chris to introduce himself and his team, including Liz, um, who's with us as well, and Joanne. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Stroob. I'm the director of the Wildlife Clinic. Um, really happy to be here to share our work with all of you, share our facility um, and everything that we do here. Um, we're really, really excited to, to show you around the place. And luckily, you've got photos in the slideshow of my face and <laughs> Joanne's face. So you can see what we look like. Um, of course, we've got to be masked up for safety. Uh, during COVID, we've had to a couple of um, you know, challenges of that, of that nature, but keeping everybody safe has been a big thing for us the last couple of months. So um, I have seven years experience of wildlife rehabilitation. Um, I was the assistant director here at the wildlife clinic for the past two years, um, and then recently came into the role of director. So my, um, I would say my specialty is, is bird rehabilitation. That's what I have the most experience with, um, but also, you know, I've worked with tons of different mammal species, squirrels, possums, um, around here, probably our most common would be squirrels, possums, and um, uh, chipmunks, things like that. Um, so, you know, and I'm here today with, uh, with uh, Liz, my assistant director, um, who is not here at the clinic with us, therefore doesn't have to be masked up, um, and our volunteer, Joanne, um, fantastic volunteer, to help me out at the clinic. So, um, Liz, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Liz. Um, I don't have much of a rehabilitation background. My background's a little bit different. Um, I was in the military for seven and a half years. After that, spent a lot of school time uh, getting my master's in psychology. After that, I uh, was gratefully offered an intern within the clinic, which um, I fell in love with wildlife rehabilitation, the clinic, the Schuylkill Center, and after my internship ended, I was very lucky um, that they had a opening um, for assistant rehabber, and I ended up getting it and have been with them ever since, and now I'm the assistant director, so very happy to be with the uh, Schuylkill Center and the clinic. Thank you, Liz. Joanne? Hi, everyone. I'm Joanne, and I'm one of the volunteers here at the clinic. I've been volunteering here for almost two years now. Uh, January will be two years. And during that time, I've uh, grown from being a clinic support person who helped with keeping things clean, keeping the room stocked, the foods prepared for the animals. Um, I've moved into animal care with additional training from the directors here. Um, the training program that they put us through is fantastic. And you can come in here with no experience and um, be ready to help take care of animals as, as soon as you feel comfortable and, and have passed uh, some of the initial requirements. We're always looking for new volunteers. Um, right now, we've got a little hold on bringing new people in because of the pandemic, but hopefully we'll be getting started uh, bringing people in again soon. Um, it's such a rewarding place to, uh, to spend time um, helping out. Uh, the staff is fantastic. Um, the support from the Nature Center is great. And um, everybody who comes in here really loves what they're doing. Yeah, we're really, really lucky at the clinic to have such a fantastic team of volunteers and then um, to have Liz as my assistant director. It's, you know, this is not a one person job by any means. So um, we'll chat a little bit more about volunteering and how you all can help us out um, at the end after the tour. Um, as Joanne said, we're a little bit limited by COVID, but we have some things in the works that we can, um, we can tell you about a little bit later. So um, with Liz and Joanne's help, let's go ahead and take a look around the clinic. And I apologize in advance for the shaky cam. I'm gonna really try and, let's see, how do I flip my camera around? There we go. Uh, I'm gonna try and uh, hold it as steady as possible here. So we'll just come right back around towards the front. 
I would say this is one of the most important rooms in the entire building. This is our kitchen area. Um, and I'll let uh, Joanne speak a little bit about, uh, about what goes on here. Thanks. Um, Mike showed a picture before of me standing in the same place without my mask. So uh, that gives you uh, a little um, feel for how long I've been here. Um, this is my second tour of the clinic. Um, this is the place where we prepare meals for all of our patients. It's really important that we find the right diet. It's a balanced diet and it's specific for um, each one of our patients needs um, based on their species, their age, um, their health at the time that they're in the clinic. Um, the directors have done a lot of research and um, formalized a lot of these diets. Um, we have ways that we can keep track of everything. This little laminated card is a diet card for the Eastern box turtle, um, which we have a few of here right now and we'll show you in a little bit. Um, this helps us prepare the foods for the patients. Um, this is an example of what a box turtle's diet looks like. And until we added the turtle kibble on the top, <laughs> it was probably a pretty good salad. It's got fruit and vegetables and lots of greens. A lot of our diets end up looking like that. You start putting them together and it's like, oh, this is nice. A little green salad and then you add the mealworms or <laughs> right. the dog food or... <laughs> this is an example of the diet that we feed to the uh, squirrels that are in our care. And you can see it's in a metal dish. If anyone has had any experience with squirrels or other small mammals, they know that if we gave them something in plastic, they'd eat that along with their dinner. We definitely don't want that. <laughs> right. And this is an example of a songbird diet. You can, uh, if, I don't know how close the picture is, but there's mealworms in here. There's some, real close on the uh, there you go. There's some seed, there's some vegetables and fruit also. And we have nutritional supplements that we add to the songbird diets for the songbirds that are in house also. We mentioned um, when we talked about volunteering that there were some things that you could do to help us out um, without being physically present. On the website that Mike mentioned, scoopalcenter.org, O-R-G, there's a list of the things that we need in the clinic. One thing right now that we're looking for are metal jar lids, very simple lids. I think this one, the pickle jar <laughs> lid and tomato sauce. <laughs> We use those to feed some of the smaller animals that we have here. And um, because they get washed so often, sometimes several times a day, they start to rust after a while. So if anyone can collect jar lids for us, we don't need the jars, just the metal lids are a real important piece for us. Um, we also look for donations of different kinds of food. During the summer in particular, when people are growing their gardens, um, if they have excess produce, we ask them to bring it in for us. In the winter, of course, that dries up a little bit, but if you ever uh, get that buy one, get one free produce at the grocery store and you think you won't need the, the second one, think of us because we can use it here. And the types of things that we look for, like I said, are on the website so you can take a look and uh, check out what else is needed. Um, we grow our, we have our own mealworm farms too. This is uh, actually some right up at the corner they're, here. They're, hope uh, no one's squeamish of bugs. Right, I hope people right aren't there. too upset, but there are some mealworms in um, this little container and some of our uh, patients here um, love mealworms. Um, I dream of them sometimes <laughs> during the summer. <laughs> we go through so many. Okay, we want to take you back now to our intensive care unit, the ICU, and show you a little bit about what goes on in there. Looks like Andrea had a question about the, the metal lids. Um, is it okay if they have a plastic rim? Um, we do prefer all metal. Uh, one of the animals that, um, that uses them are our squirrels. Um, the baby squirrels will drink their um, formula out of them when they get to a certain age. And as mentioned with the metal versus um, plastic bowl there, they will chew them. So all metal is, um, is best. All right, so on to the ICU. Liz is going to tell us a little bit about the ICU, the intensive care unit. 
Um, we're just gonna take a peek in here. We're not gonna go in. We actually do have some animals um, in here from a little bit earlier today. So we don't wanna stress them out too much by going in there and, and talking. Um, but we can maybe get some close-ups as Liz is speaking. So the ICU is really just to provide a quiet, calm environment for a, a recovery when the patients first get into the clinic. Um, so you gotta realize when these patients come in, they are very stressed. Um, especially if they're injured or if they're being picked up by a human. So putting them in this room where it's very quiet um, helps them not only to de-stress a little bit before we're able to do an actual exam in the exam room, but we're also able to do certain other things such as provide heat. Um, we have heating pads. Um, you can see a heating pad in the very back. Uh, it's actually linked to one of the metal cages um, we also have the incubator, um, which is on the other side. Um, there's an O2 diffuser, uh, which is to treat shock. Um, you can see the, the, the hood right there in the, um, the incubator. And the hood is for different size patients. So we can literally put, you know, anything from a songbird all the way up to a squirrel in there. Um, when needed for shock or even for calming methods. Um, so one of the big things when talking about if anybody finds an animal, the most important thing when finding an injured animal is putting them in a warm, quiet, dark place. Um, it helps to reduce the amount of stress. Um, stress exacerbates a lot of these injuries and stress can actually kill certain patients. It's just some of these species are very, very fragile. Um, so really minimal handling, no food or water, and really getting it into a closed container and calling the clinic. Um, you, calling the clinic that's closest to you is preferable, but um, our clinic does have a 24-hour hotline. Um, you may have to leave a voicemail, but we will call back within 30 minutes. So please, I mean, even if it's a general question, if you found something, don't hesitate to give us a call. We'd rather educate you and let you know what's going on and how to best um, take care of it than, you know, making the situation worse. All right, and on to the exam room, just through here. All right, well, I can probably open that door up, yep. So this is our exam room. Um, just gonna get a shot from the doorway, wide angle there. So we're set up uh, very much like a vet clinic. Um, you can see we've got our exam table here, cabinets with um, all of the supplies that we need to treat animals as they come in. Um, we've got some lab equipment over here. We can perform pretty much any procedure that needs to be done to get these animals back on their feet here in house. With some exceptions, um, we don't have an x-ray as of yet. It's definitely a big goal of ours. Um, that would be a huge diagnostic help. Um, a lot of times we'll get, you know, songbirds who have, we know that they have an injury, probably a fracture or something like that. We, you know, it can be difficult to feel exactly where that injury is and how severe it is. So x-rays are helpful for that. At the moment, we, um, we rely on veterinarians to help us out, veterinarians who very generously volunteer their time and facilities. Um, we can take animals in for things like that or major surgeries. Um, when they come up, you know, we need help from, um, from veterinarians um, who are willing to, to volunteer their time for us. But like I said, most procedures we can take care of right here. Our lab allows us to run um, basic blood work. Um, we have a lead test machine which is really excellent, um, this guy right here. As you can imagine, um, in more urban settings, lead uh, poisoning is a real big problem. Animals just pick it up from the environment. Um, it happens a lot in pigeons and possums um, because of the way that they feed. So if we can test for that, um, you know, some of the symptoms of lead poisoning are pretty recognizable. Um, there are some neurological symptoms to look for, but if we can be sure that that's what's happening, 
um, that can inform our, our treatment decisions. Same thing for um, looking, at, looking at poop under a microscope very close up is a, is a really great diagnostic tool that we use a lot. Um, sometimes animals will come in with kind of a malaise and you know, we're not really sure what's going on and then we find out they've got parasites um, or something else going on that we can um, tell using our uh, microscope. Um, and then again, the, the centrifuge for running some blood work. And our lab equipment was very generously donated. Um, that's a huge help to us. Donation of um, medical equipment itself or, or the funds to, to get it. The more we have, the better care we can provide to animals, especially if we can do things in house, like blood work, like fecal tests, like lead tests. We don't have to send these things out and wait for them. We can do them ourselves and then um, you know, start treatment right away. So, um, so that's that. The uh, medical care that we provide could be its own whole presentation. So um, I think I'll leave it there, but if you have any uh, specific questions, of course, feel free to leave them in chat. Otherwise, we're gonna move on to our animal care rooms. I'm just gonna stop here and mention our outdoor enclosures. We have um, a lot of outdoor enclosures that we move animals to when they're um, getting ready for release, pre-release enclosures. Obviously, we can't show them to you because it's very dark outside. That wouldn't work out. But this is our little map of what we've got going on outside. Chris, can you pause for a moment? Yep. Question in chat, how costly is the x-ray machine that we need? Have to get back to you on that. Yeah. <laughs> costly, costly. Costly. They're, that's, they're, um, it's, it's a pretty big investment. Thank you. And for everybody, keep the questions coming. Um, how, Olivia wants to know if you can tell, how can you tell if an animal is poisoned? And Olivia is six and a half, by the way, a future rehabilitator. Well, with lead poisoning specifically, uh, one of the big things to look at is the animal can't balance very well. Um, we call it ataxia. Um, you know, they, they stumble around, they fall over. Um, that's a big thing to look for. There can be a lot of things that cause that, um, but that's definitely one of the signs. Good. Thank you. Thank you, for Rebecca, for the, uh, the note in chat. Ah, so this, this is one of our rehabilitation rooms. Um, typically, we would use this room for uh, raptors. Um, the animal that you can probably hear squeaking in the background is not a raptor. We don't have any raptors in here currently. Um, we do have these nice metal enclosures um, and then these slightly smaller ones over here. Right now, what we've got in here are pigeons and a lot of them. So there's one guy in there. Um, the reason that we have this room normally set up for raptors is that when they first come in, oftentimes raptors will need um, cage rest. Um, they'll need to be in a confined space so that they can't move around and further injure themselves if they're recovering from a wing injury, something like that. Um, so these cages are nice and secure for them. They're big enough that they can move around comfortably, but small enough that they can't really injure themselves. Um, we try and keep predator and prey species separate for uh, reasons you can imagine, the stress, even if the animals can't see each other. And you'll notice we keep these enclosures covered um, to prevent the animals from seeing each other and also from seeing us um, to help manage their stress. But even if they can't see each other, often they can smell each other, they can hear each other, and it's stressful on both sides. The prey animal, knows that there's a predator somewhere that wants to harm it, and the predator knows that there's a prey animal and can't get to it. So to avoid that, we just don't house them in the same room, um, you know, and we, we, we keep them separate. So if we were to get a raptor, some of these guys would have to shuffle around. But for the time being, we've, we've just gotten a lot of pigeons recently, um, sort of a flood of pigeons. And as they're one of my favorite animals, I really don't mind that. Um, but it's just been helpful to, to be able to house them in here in kind of their own little block. So, oh, and the, the squeaking sound that you might be able to hear in the background, that's a baby pigeon. Um, they make that noise. They're called squeakers um, because of that noise that they make. So he's, he's just, uh, he's asking for food. So we'll check in on him after the tour and, and see whether he needs a little bit of a top up of his dinner. Hey, Chris, can I jump in? Lucy asked a question that's so obvious, none of us thought to say it. 
uh, which is, is the clinic in the same building that the art installation area is in. So um, the Schuylkill Center and uh, Andrea thankfully answered in chat, but just to explain, the Schuylkill Center is located off Hagee's Mill Road. The Visitor Center is off of Hagee's Mill Road, actually, and that's the part that visitors come. The clinic itself is off Port Royal Avenue. So it's on the same large rectangle of property, but it's on a different road. So actually people have often come to the Nature Center with like a baby robin in a box. And we've had to send them to drive around to go back to the wildlife clinic. So the clinic, unfortunately, is not set up for visitors and that the animals who are there need often dark and quiet. So um, it's not a place that people come in and visit. Uh, nonetheless, i uh, love for you to visit the Visitor Center. That's off Hagee's Mill Road. That's where the art installation is. Yes, that's where the Observation Beehive is as well. The Beehive didn't do so well this year, but uh, we haven't replaced the bees yet because winter's coming. Nonetheless, uh, a lot off Hagee's Mill clinics on Port Royal. So thanks, Lucy, and thanks, um, Amanda, for answering. Lisa wanted to know, Chris, if spotted lanternflies have been found to be poisonous to anything? That's a question. We've, yeah, we've gotten reports that, that native birds, like cat birds, are starting to eat them. I don't think we've seen any ill effects from that. Uh -huh. Good. Um, and Rebecca answered. Rebecca's here as well. Rebecca is the former director of the Wildlife Clinic and still a consultant to us. She's been our director the last two years. Chris was the assistant director under her. She's back in her native Nova Scotia. Um, and Chris is now the director. And, and Rebecca is staying involved in helping us as we move forward. So, hey, Rebecca, it's good to see you uh, in the chat. I really appreciate your work the last two years. Somebody else also mentioned uh, the story in the Inquirer today about hundreds of migrating songbirds that were found window struck um and chris if there's happier news in that story you get a lot of window struck birds at this time of year and you can actually fix some of them correct yes we can so that that's that's our big um kind of our big animal of the season right now are migratory songbirds which we're gonna that's the next room after this one that we'll we'll pop into and show you around a bit you got it uh, so yeah with migrating songbirds our the number one thing that we see is our window strikes. So um, that's, you know, when an animal, when a, when a bird hits the glass of a window and gets a concussion, sometimes they, they can injure themselves further. It's because birds can't really recognize glass as a solid object. They just see, maybe there's trees on the other side. There's a nice um, space for them to get into, to get away from a predator or another bird, or maybe they see another bird in the reflection and they want to go, you know, check that out and see what's that guy doing in my territory. And they fly into the glass often at high speeds. And then when, what, during migration season, what happens is they're trying to get from point A to point B pretty quickly and they're often flying at night. So to compound the glass issue, they're also being confused by lights, um, you know, buildings that are lit up, especially large skyscrapers. Um, so that's why we see a large influx of, of window strikes during this time of year. We get them year round, but right now is kind of the biggest um, time for them. Great. So. There's more questions in chat. We'll let Chris keep going and then we'll, we'll make sure we get to all these questions. Yeah. So uh, Joanne's going to talk a little bit about our next room, uh, which is where we house a lot of our mammal patients. All right. This is right now um, through, through the spring and fall season our baby nursery, um, mostly mammals, as Chris said, and right now, mostly squirrels. Uh, most of the squirrels that we have on site as patients are a little bit older. Um, the baby season is ending. Uh, so these squirrels are now being weaned onto a, a diet that will help support them when they get out into the environment where they came from. and um be be ready to feed themselves we do have some squirrels here we want to introduce you to um, we've got uh two little female squirrels i don't know if they're going to come out of their their couch but we'll Probably show not. you their enclosure they Safety. seem to be sleeping right now um yeah but this is a, it typical, is a little late for them yeah this is a typical squirrel enclosure older squirrels um, it's a wire cage. They need to be wire for the same reasons that their dishes need to be metal uh, or ceramic because they will chew their way through and get out of the enclosure. Um, just like with the animals in intensive care, you can see we keep them covered up. 
Um, we keep our voices low while we're in here when we're volunteering and, and cleaning their enclosures and feeding them. We try and keep our voices down entirely. Um, and that's what uh, a volunteer shift is like. Uh, we come in, in the, uh, for our shift time. We help out around the clinic. Um, if you have animal care training, you're able to come in with the squirrels and the birds that we're gonna show you next and um, help weigh them, make sure that they're gaining or maintaining their weights. We'll clean their enclosures and we'll feed them. And uh, especially in the season when they're babies, we feed them several times a day. Mm -hmm. um, so something I want to show you over here are some little nesting material that we use um, in their enclosures. And these are things that volunteers have put together for us. These little sacks were um, from an organization called Relief Crafters. They made them for us. And you can see the squirrels are able to get inside and feel safe and secure in there. We have these little knitted nests also that another group made for us. The group is called Knitted Nests and little um, fleece uh, pockets too. The animals like to hide in there and it makes them feel really safe, keeps them warm. Um, and uh, as you can see, those two squirrels that we tried to, to show you, um, they curl up in there and, and sleep together and they're very comfortable. We also need some nesting boxes. And if you get boxes this size um, from Amazon or other delivery companies, these would be great uh, to drop off for us um, because as the squirrels get a little older, a little bigger, we put them in enclosures that are larger and we can give them boxes like this instead of the smaller sacks that they uh, were nesting in. Yeah, we've sort of run through our supply um, this baby season of, of boxes. so. Normally we would say, please don't leave us cardboard boxes, but in this case, definitely need them. I think with all of us uh, using, uh, you know, being at home, I think we're going to get now an influx of boxes. So that well, will be great. We'll sign up when we've got enough. <laughs> can, I, can I seek in two more questions here, Chris? Yep. Uh, so Baxter, who's seven, wants to see a baby pigeon. That might be hard, right? We'll circle back around to the baby pigeon. We might be able to peek in on him real quick. But Baxter... Pigeons are one of Chris's favorite animals in the world. Chris is very special that way. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> and Amelia, yeah. who's six, this is great. We have a lot of questions from, from uh, our younger kids. This is great. Amelia wants to know, when do squirrels usually go to bed? Whenever they want to. <laughs> no, squirrels, uh, squirrels are diurnal, which means they're active during the day. Um, and they, they tend to sleep um, when it gets dark, sort of like people. And that's true of our babies too. Um, Joanne mentioned feeding them many, many times throughout the day, um, four or five, even six times. It's a lot. Uh, and we have to keep them on a, on a good schedule because we need to feed them spaced out enough that they want to eat at each meal, but we can't feed them too late because if we try and feed them too late at night, they get kind of cranky. So, <laughs> there you uh, go. so that, that's, that's part of our challenge in the spring. Yeah. So. All right, we're gonna move you next door to see where we have some other birds. The songbirds are in here. I think Liz is gonna tell us about our bird room. So, so that, this is our, our bird room. Um, so once again, like somebody was you know, brought up earlier, we do get lots of migrating songbirds, uh, window strikes. Um, to our left, you'll see some incubators. We do have some birds in there that um, I don't, I'm not sure. This one's, this is the Viri, but um, okay. they're pretty stressy. So we'll, we'll let them be, but you can see we've got, that's a little basket that we've got him in um, to keep, he's got a wing injury. So we want to keep him in that little basket um, to keep him from injuring himself. Yeah, like that. Now if I can also some ad advanced zooming tips here. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. If you're on speaker view, when Liz speaks, you'll see her. And so it'll be harder to see what Chris is showing us on the camera. So though we'd love to look at Liz, if you wanna see uh, what Chris is showing, you can go to the top right and you can pin. Um, if you look at the choices of things, you see the word pin. So if you go to Chris's, where his tour is, go to his tile and go to the top right of that, you can pin it. So 
Um, instead of speaker view, you'll see whatever he's doing while Liz narrates, and then you can switch back again. So, but that's advanced zooming. So go ahead. Sorry, Liz, to interrupt. No worries. Um, so we'll also, in those little boxes uh, that Joanne was holding, we'll also put babies in there um, in the incubator to provide uh, heat. Um, it's definitely support for critical patients as well, such as this um, beery that has a, um, an injured wing. Um, once you look further into the room, you'll see that we have different types of kind of housing, um, bird housing. So we'll have soft cages. Um, we'll have mesh baskets. These are really important to prevent feather damage. Um, then we have like our soft-sided carriers. Uh, these are very, very super valuable to us. Um, we can't have enough of these. Um, above you can actually see that we have lights. These are actually UV lights. Um, these are really critical for growing birds. We'll actually have them up, you know, actually on during the day and then we'll turn them off at night. Um, it's really to promote uh, growth in a lot of our birds. Um, and then, so we have quite a few morning doves in this room. Um, I think um, Chris is going to show you one of the morning doves. I think we're actually gonna, so we mentioned a baby pigeon earlier. I think we're gonna see if we can sneak a peek at a baby morning dove. Let's see. It's coming up to see. say hello. Let's actually see if we can. So he's making a little noise here. That's his begging for food noise, similar to the pigeon. Let's see if we can just. We don't want to let him out, obviously. There he is. And this is mourning as an M O U R, as in their sad, because they have that very soft coo sound that they do. So they're the. Natural. They're a common the little... native bird. Go ahead, Chris. Um, so the little baby morning dove, um, we'll show him to you super quick because the fact that he's begging from us, um, we actually don't want him to be doing that. So he can feed himself. Um, he knows how to eat seeds all on his own. Um, he's growing really well. He's got great feathers. But when he sees a person, he still wants to be fed. So in just a little bit, we're going to be pairing him up with an older morning dove in one of our outdoor enclosures. Um, once we know that they're going to get along, they're not going to fight with each other, the older one's not going to bully the little one, um, we'll go ahead and let them spend some time outside so that the little baby, who thus far, as long as he's been with us, has been by himself, um, you know, we'll make sure that he gets, um, he gets to learn how to be a morning dove from an adult morning dove. So that behavior of him begging from people, you know, he, he'll, he'll cut that out as soon as he gets around an adult and, um, you know, learns how to be the species that he is. And that's really critical for us with any time we have babies, if we can match them up with one of their own species. Squirrels, for example, we have those two little squirrels together. Um, that's huge for us. It's really important for us to be able to put them with one of their own species so that they can really learn. I'm a morning dove. I'm a squirrel. I'm not a person. Um, so that's a really big part of our job when we're dealing with young animals. So now we'll move on. Hope this camera thing isn't too dizzying for you. So this right here is our quiet room. We're going to open the door, take a peek in, and then close it and talk out here because um, as the name would imply, this room is for quiet. Um, so we're just going to pop the door open and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it. All right, and we'll come back out. So let me flip the camera around so this is not just me speaking to a closed door here. There we go. So the quiet room um, is for patients who are really, really stressy, uh, really stress prone. So all of our patients were worried about stress with them. Um, you know, they're wild animals. They don't want to be around people. Being in captivity is, is not fun for them. But certain species take that to another level um, and it can be really harmful for them to even just have the ambient noise of people walking in and out of a room. So in the quiet room right now, we've got two baby cottontails. They're pretty late in the season babies. Um, they'll be with us for a little bit longer. They mature pretty quickly. So we expect that um, if all goes well, we'll be able to return them to their natural habitat within the next couple of weeks. 
Um, but part of making sure that we can get them there is making sure that they're as stress-free as possible. So they were in the little green bin that was on the table that you saw. Um, it's nice and protective, it's dark, it's quiet. Um, they can just be in there, eat, sleep, <laughs> and be comfortable, and then eventually we'll, um, we'll move them outside. I saw the question, is a cottontail a bunny? Yes, yes, cottontails are our native rabbit species, eastern cottontails. Um, so they'll be in here, and then we will move them outside once they're ready to, uh, to go outside and, and deal with the colder temperatures. Right, I'm gonna flip this back around. All right, so um, Liz, I think, is gonna tell us about uh, this room, which is mainly reptiles and um, waterfowl. Before we do that, this is, let, me, let, me, let me mute myself okay. for the water noise. But Chris, before you do that, um, <laughs> there's a request that rabbits are the, this person's favorite. Can, can we see? And the answer is likely not, right? Yeah, there, we, you know, it, it would be too stressful even just to open that box and look in on them. Um, we want to make sure that they have the best possible chance of returning to the wild. So um way they're they are cute but for for their health we'll go ahead and let them be okay thank you chris go ahead liz so this is our last uh main um room such as you know like chris said it's the reptile waterfowl room um so as you can see as he's walking around um, when he first walked in to the left there was a big tub um that was our northern uh red-bellied cooter which is an endangered uh, species here in Pennsylvania. Um, so she's actually going to be with us over the winter. Um, just because of where she was located, uh, it was uh, polluted and unfortunately it is not ready for her to uh, return back to um, because at this point in time, uh, reptiles can't be released back into the wild between October 1st and May 1st. Um, because of the fact that they do hibernate um, and they need that time. So we will overwinter reptiles during this time period. Um, so the reason why we have the reptiles kind of separated this way is because reptiles can pass illnesses between not only one another, but as well as humans. Um, separate housing is really important to prevent cross contamination. Um, here you can see one of our um, our box turtles. Uh, this one is used to be a, a pet that was actually dropped off at our, our facility um, who has stayed with us for quite a while. Um, you can see that we have quite a bit of lights going on right now. Um, the lights are to mimic summer light cycle. It's actually to prevent the hibernation. We don't want hibernation while they're in the clinic it, because when they're hibernating, they're unable to heal correctly. So we want them to actually um, continue their normal um, as if there's no winner. Um, so other than that, I mean, this is a really important room for us, especially with, you know, um, box turtles are very uh, prevalent. Um, a lot more people are seeing them, especially while driving. Um, just be super careful. If you have any questions on seeing a turtle or what to do, please give us a call. It is very important on how you pick them up and how you um, relocate them from one place to another. Um, they, they have to be located and picked up in the direction that they were pointing. Um, they have compasses kind of ingrained in them to know where exactly they were going. Um, so I love this room. This is an amazing room. We're having a, a little bit of a, um, a light, uh, tricky light situation. So I'm just gonna, um, gonna pause for just a second uh, while we fix one of the turtle's lights and we'll be right back with you. Never mind, false alarm, uh, Joanne got it. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go ahead and we'll take a peek at that baby pigeon and then uh, and then we'll carry on our way. While we're on that topic, Chris, um, Marissa wants to know what happens to their internal compasses when they're in the wildlife center. So, um, you know, what happens, I guess, to a turtle perhaps when it doesn't, ooh, 
hibernate for a so, year. This little guy has a leg injury. That's a little boot that's on him. Um, so we're just, we've got him in a little cast. So that's why he's, he doesn't have the best balance, but he is eating great and super energetic and is getting, um, getting medications to help him out with that recovery. So. And what kind of bird again was that? That was uh, the baby pigeon. Baby pigeon, there we go. Yep. Uh, so the internal compasses. So it's, it's really, that's a good, great question. It's really important for us. Let me turn my camera back around. It's really important for us to release adult animals back where they came from um, as close as possible to the original location. Um, partially for that reason, um, we don't want to release them somewhere way far away from where they came from and they don't know how to get back home. Um, a lot of animals do have a very strong homing instinct though, uh, and they will try, they will make an effort to get back to where they came from. And in the process, cross a lot of roads, run into a lot of other animals' territories. So um, animals that do have a strong homing instinct, they're going to try and get home, and we don't want to make that harder for them. Um, and animals that may not necessarily have as strong of a, a, an internal um, compass, a homing mechanism, we don't want to release them somewhere where they're just going to be confused and not know where they are. Um, and certain species have really tight home ranges. So um, with the reptiles, for example, when we take in um, a reptile, we need to know exactly where it came from, um, almost down to sort of the latitude, longitude coordinates of where that animal came from. So that when it comes time to take, put it back uh, where, you know, where it was found, it goes exactly back where it came from in the direction it was going, if we can manage it. Um, so that's, that's really important for us. Well, I know box turtles are famous for that, but that's true of many other reptiles too. Yeah, many other many other reptiles. Um, wow. You know, we like have, if you if you find a box turtle and you know you can't drive it into a nice forest and let it go, it won't be happy there. No, no. We sometimes we think we know what a good habitat is for an animal, but the animal knows. You know, this is where its home is. There are certain circumstances. You know, if we've we've had calls that you know someone found a. Uh, a duck that was right in the middle of a parking lot in, in a big industrial complex. That's not a great space for that animal. We might be able to find a nearby habitat that's a little bit more suitable, but for the most part, you know, we want to put them back where they were found because that's where home is. Lucy wants to know if we have any large animals. What kind of animals are in the outdoor areas? So outdoors is a lot of what we have inside, actually a lot of squirrels. So our teenage squirrels make up the, the bulk of the animals that we have outside. Right now, they're, they're acclimating to outdoor temperatures. Um, probably the largest animals that we get here are actually large birds. So geese, herons, um, red-tailed hawks. Um, those would probably be the biggest. And then for mammals, possums. Um, but every animal that comes in and is inside for any length of time needs to spend some time outside to get used to the outdoor temperatures, to exercise, to forage, to perform natural behaviors, especially if they've been in here a really long time. You know, you can imagine if you're, um, you know, you're sick in bed for a couple of weeks, you need some time to get back to feeling um, fully well again. So our outdoor enclosures help us out with that. It gives the animal space and they're away from people. You know, we're only in there you know, a couple times a day to offer them food. Otherwise they have it to themselves and they don't have to worry about it being stressed out by our presence, so. Grace is looking for book recommendations for learning more about native animals and or wildlife rehab. Oh, um, we just were going through that with uh, the volunteers asking yeah. everybody for some uh, recommendations for that. Um, there are lots of great books, but of course being put on the spot like yeah. this, I can't remember one. <laughs> But um, we could certainly put a list together of the ones that we've been mm -hmm. identifying and share them with the group at a later date. Sure. Um, what age group or was she asking? Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe Grace yeah. will, will respond to that. Uh, Beverly wants to know if we still want old towels and linens? Not at the moment, um, but we will probably within the next couple of months. Um, we're going through and website. doing a, we're doing a fall cleaning. <laughs> you didn't so, show us the room with a wall of towels. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Every so often we do need to replace them. Uh, yeah. As you can imagine, things get chewed, but right at the moment we're, we're good on linens. Yes. 
Olivia has a follow-up. Do you have any raccoons? No raccoons. Actually, that's a great question. So the wildlife clinic at the Schuylkill Center does not take rabies vector species currently. So a rabies vector species is an animal that has a higher than um, average incidence of having rabies. Um, it's a natural illness. It's out there in the wild, you know, and, you know, every so often we, we come in contact with these animals that, that do have it. So rabies vector species in Pennsylvania are raccoons, groundhogs, skunks, foxes, coyotes, and bats. So the wildlife clinic at the Schuylkill Center doesn't take any of those animals. But if you have a problem with one of them, if you see one that's sick or injured, you can always give us a call and we can lend guidance on what to do. Because um, mm -hmm. it depends on where you're calling from and what exactly is going on with the animal. The biggest thing is if you see an injured um, raccoon or any of those other rabies vector species, that you don't try to handle it. Um, that you keep you know, kids and pets and yourself away from them and just give us a call right away so that we can advise you. Um, with rabies vector species, the handling of them is, um, you know, it's really important that only certain people are, are handling and transporting them. Mm -hmm. uh, Becky's here. She's a current volunteer and she's exhorting people to help us out. So it's great. Thank you, Becky, for your support. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. <laughs> uh, Charlotte wants to know, how do you feed a baby squirrel? No. <laughs> Carefully. Do you want to answer that? I guess sure. it depends on the age, right? It depends on the age. Um, the very young ones are syringe fed with a formula that's specific for their needs. Um, as they get a little bit older, we use something called rodent block. It's like puppy chow, but it's for rodents. And we'll mix that with their formula. Um, and eventually we'll be weaning them off the formula onto the solid foods. And um, once they get to solid foods, we put those little dishes that I showed you in the kitchen that are filled with the rodent block and fruits and vegetables and nuts. We put it in their enclosure with fresh water and they um, learn to feed themselves and that's an important step for them to get outside. Great. Uh, oh, yeah. Amanda, thank you, reminded me that the question came a little while back and I missed it. Um, how is the clinic funded? Uh, are there government or foundation grants for this purpose? Um, I can start and Chris, you can, you can add on, but um, not a lot of government grants for the clinic, uh, unfortunately. Um, we do uh, rely on foundation grants. Mostly the clinic is funded from the generosity of the people who bring an animal to the wildlife clinic, which is really sweet and very special. Um, as you can imagine, uh, animals have worse healthcare plans than people do. <laughs> There's no HMO for covering squirrels. So uh, thankfully, you know, we get a couple of thousand animals and, you know, many of those people give a donation uh, as, they, as they bring us an animal, which is really great. And that's, that's the, a big piece of how the clinic is funded through the generosity of donors who come. So thank you. Chris, do you want to add more to that? That 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 about sums it up. I mean, the generosity of people who are who are finding these animals and bringing them in is is just enormous. I mean, that that really keeps us going. Um, right. So it's a huge huge help. I mean, you know, everything anything that we can get donated is really really helpful to us. And the grants that we've gotten are there's uh, like small family foundations that have been really helpful with us too. And we use we we tend to use a lot of those foundation grants to build some of the new cages that we're doing. So that that, that tends to to be how that works out. Chris wants to know if we ever record and share videos of returning animals to the wild. We do. We do post them on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we're uh, and YouTube as well. And YouTube. Yep. Um, There's a great one of you releasing ducks recently. <laughs> oh, that one's great. It's very, it's informative. It's got a lot of narration, so. There's a beautiful video of us uh, releasing a great blue heron earlier uh, this year. Um, uh, and out into the creek and watching it just check out its surroundings and immediately started fishing. And it was a beautiful uh, little experience. You have to be careful of those because they, they that, that beak is a spear. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have, um, I don't think I've, I've panned over to it. We have safety goggles in the exam room for um, herons and loons and grebes and things with sharp <laughs> dagger-like beaks. So we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube. There's a YouTube channel for the Schuylkill Center. 
Um, so if you, you know, search for us in any of those platforms, you should be able to find, you'll get things across the whole organization, but there are releases of the wildlife clinic as well. Um, Olivia wants to know what are the best wild animals to have as pets? Uh, none. <laughs> yeah. Wild animals do not make good pets. Um, they're, they're wild. So pet animals that, mm. you know, we would normally see like guinea pigs, pet rabbits, cats, dogs, those are domestic animals. So um, they've spent a lot of time with humans over, you know, over centuries. centuries <laughs> and they've gotten used to living with people, but wild animals never really do. So it's really important that wild animals stay wild. That's our whole goal at the Wildlife Clinic is we want these animals to be able to return and live their normal, natural, wild lives. Um, you know, if you see these, the videos on, on social media platforms of people with like a pet squirrel or something, usually they're not telling you the whole story. It's a little moment in time where that squirrel looks like it's really cute to have as a pet, but what you're not seeing is, you know, that squirrel destroying the house and, um, you know, they have very sharp claws climbing up your arms. It's, uh, you know, ah. so the best way to help animals out is to try and wild animals is to make sure that they have, you know, a great habitat to live in. Um, if they're injured or orphaned, certainly you can bring them to us and, you know, we can help them out here. Um, but just advocating for them to, to live their wild lives mm -hmm. out where they're supposed to, which is in the wild. And I think over the years, we've gotten some animals brought to us who have been pets and the challenge is to reacclimate them, to reteach them how to be wild animals. That's those, a challenge. Those two little squirrels, actually, that we showed you are, are um, um, you know, uh, sort of that that kind of circumstance. But they're doing really well. Good. Uh, you know, we're, but that is a challenge for us. We do need to sort of rewild some animals right. um, that have come in. Um, and, uh, you know, people have really great intentions. Um, but, again, our, our hotline is basically 24-7. So if you think that there's an animal who needs help, you can always give us a call and we can advise you on the best course of action to take. And Amanda put the uh, Mallard release on, on uh, the link there. So you can, oh. everybody, it's, it's in chat. So you can, you can check that out. Um, Marissa wants to know how, what do you feed large meat eating birds like herons? Ooh. Sushi. Heron. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is one of the more challenging foods for us to acquire. So if you have any fish in your freezer and you don't think you're gonna go through it we would love to have it um and we hang on to that when we do have patients like herons and we actually have a, a, a black-backed gull currently in care who goes through a lot of fish um so yeah fish and what's your source do we like go to the acme and get and go to the fish department i <laughs> uh, have to you know sometimes that's, that's fun. um but we we can also you know we purchase fish specifically for um feeding animals you will use um, suppliers who would, you know, supply zoos, for example, for some of our, um, some of our foods, yes. some of our more esoteric foods. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from people in, in the chat? Chris, how did you fall into this back in the day? How did you decide to become a rehabilitator? You know, it was almost by accident. I was looking for experience with animals outside of just a, um, you know, pet and um, like a cat dog veterinary clinic. Um, I was living in New York City at the time. There's a wildlife rehabilitation center called Wild Bird Fund there. Um, I started as a volunteer and just fell in love with it and just wanted to keep doing it. And it stuck. Um, so I was with them for five years. Um, and it's just, that's, that's how any rehabilitator I've met has sort of fallen into it. You start as a volunteer. Right. Just, you keep going. You keep learning. We're always learning. That's a big thing for us here is trying to... Yes learn new things as often as we can, learn from other rehabilitators. Um, whatever we're doing, we wanna be able to do it better and better and to provide better care and you know, release more animals back um, into the wild. So uh, it's just a continual, you know, it's a continual learning process for sure. Lisa wonders about poly fleece blankets. Do we need those? I'm not even sure what poly fleece is, but go ahead. Is that like the... Um, that's the fleece that we use for the squirrels. Yeah. So that's always yeah. helpful. Squirrels those those are helpful. So yeah. the answer is yes. Okay, good. Yes. I would say that's probably an exception to the we don't need the linens, linens right now yeah. is, yeah, right. the fleece we, blankets. We do go through those a lot. Yeah. Good. And um, you can leave things in that little barn outside the clinic's door, right? But you can also bring them to the nature center, uh, to the 
the uh, receptionist at the nature center and, and we'll get them to the, the clinic as well. So there's actually two places to drop off, whichever is easier for you. Right. Best thing to do if you are, if you find an animal in the evening is to call us first. Oh yeah. Um, so oh, I'm is- sorry. I'm probably dropping off blankets. I'm sorry. Not animals. Yeah. Nice. Got it. Yes. Go ahead. But finish the sentence. Go finish so you, the thought. For, for animals. If you have, if you're trying to drop off an animal, definitely take it to the clinic, not the yes. nature. Yes. No. Yes. Um, and if you come during the hours that we're open, um, which is nine to six on weekdays and 10 to four on weekends, um, we have a shed that's the wildlife drop-off shed. So you can just bring an animal at any time during that. You don't have to make an appointment. Um, if you find something after that, you know, either very early in the morning or later in the evening, just call us first and we'll determine whether we want you to bring it by and leave it for us or, um, you know, or an alternative. Mm -hmm. Grace wants to know, do we ever treat larger animals like deer or bears? We do not. Um, we had that one bear in the area. <laughs> last Was it last year? Yes. I think uh, it was last June. A year ago, June. But deer are tricky. There are a lot, a lot of regulations around the rehabilitation of deer in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't think there are any wildlife clinics in Pennsylvania that can take adult deer. Right. Uh, Rebecca may know more if um, she wants to mention that in chat. It's also uh, impossible to transport them too. That's, that's hard. Yeah, it's deer are challenging. Um, but again, if you have an issue with deer, if there's an injured one, even if we can't take it, we can, we can give you some advice. Um, with deer, sometimes even if it's something like a broken leg, the advice may be just leave them alone. Um, deer can actually adapt pretty well to living on three legs in a lot of circumstances. So you know, that's another one of those things. Just give us a call and we're happy to sort of talk you through what, what should be done with them. Some of our neighbors saw a mangy fox recently, maybe even at the school center. What can you do for a mangy fox, if anything? So that's a tricky one too, because the answer really boils down to leave them alone. Um, you know, there are some things online that may suggest medications, but that's not really an option for them. Um, you know, we would need to have them under the supervision of a rehabilitator and a veterinarian to do the dosing for any medication for mange. And then beyond that, sometimes it's not mange, it's something else that's causing right. the hair. Right. So, you know, the, it's a complicated problem, but the answer basically boils down to if they're still walking around and, and moving around, just let them be. Um, uh, one of the places that they um, can pass mange between one another are outdoor feeding stations like for feeding of like cats outdoors and things like that. So um, that's often my advice too, is just be cautious with those things so that we're not transmitting the mange. We were asked what the 24 hour phone number was. Um, Liz put the, the answer in there, which is great. Um, so though we are two buildings, we have one phone number um, and you, you press one to get to the visitor center, press two, you get to the wildlife clinic, right? And that's the 24 hour hotline. Mm -hmm. Liz, Liz, can you un unmute yourself for a moment? You're also the volunteer coordinator of the clinic as the assistant director, right? Yes. So tell us about if people are interested in volunteering, because a few are, what should they do next? Because we, sure. we have to wait. Go ahead. So I sent the link online. Um, so what you can do is you can sign up through the application. What it's going to do is you will um, put yourself into our system. It's called uh, logistics. Um, what it's going to do is have you process it. You're going to put your information, but it will say um, that we're not currently taking volunteers at this point in time, but it's putting your information into our system. So therefore we can send you um, newsletters and let you know what's going on. So when we do start, um, you know, having orientations and bringing people back into the clinic, such as new volunteers, you will be the first to know because you're already in our system. And like I said, we will definitely let you know as soon as we we start doing that that's great thank you liz i'm watching the clock it's it's after eight we're going to go for like five more minutes or a couple more questions lucy wonders for people who can sew do you need more of those squirrel sleeping bags and is there a tutorial <laughs> for how to do that is there a pattern so i would reach out to that organization specifically mm -hmm. um i wonder if we can get the links put in the chat right. um I don't have crafters. them. Yeah, relief crafters. They have very specific patterns. Um, and same thing for the knitted nests. They have to be done to a really exacting specification so the animals can't harm themselves on them. 
Um, but I, I would look into those organizations and see, I think they're always taking volunteers and they send out the patterns and right. um, the specifications for that. Olivia said, thanks for the program. I loved it, but I have to go to bed. She's our six and a half year old. So <laughs> good night, Olivia. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Chris, any closing words you want to offer to everybody uh, about the clinic, about the important work that you do, the life-saving work that you do, and how they can help? So thank you so much for joining us. We, we really appreciate you coming and, and checking out what we do, um, taking a look around our facility. Um, you know, as mentioned, donations are huge to us, um, donations of produce. Um, we have our Amazon wish list and um, list of, uh, of things that we need donated on the website. Um, so that, that would be a huge help to us. Definitely sign up with that link um, to get information about volunteering. We will have that out as soon as we can. We're also working on ways that um, people can volunteer for us while the pandemic is ongoing, while we still have some restrictions on how many people we can have in the building. And again, you'll get that information if you sign up through that link um, that Liz sent out. We'll be sending out all that information. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, spread the word, your friends, neighbors, family, that if they find an injured animal or they have a concern um, to reach out to us, to call us. Um, for non-emergencies, you can always email us at wildlife at schuylkillcenter.org, um, which is also on our website. <laughs> Um, we're happy to help. We're here to educate um, and inform. And then, you know, when an animal needs help um, to try and, and help it and um, get it back out to its life in the wild. So um, that's spreading the word of, of what we do is a huge help to us. Good. Um, can you send the links, et cetera, in an email? Eileen asked. Um, so we'll be sending you all a follow-up email if, if you registered with an email, which I, th I think most of you do. Um, so yes, uh, in, in our, in, when we send you the evaluation, maybe we'll, we'll include those links, but Amanda just answered and said, yes, she can do that. So we're, so we're on it. Thank you, Amanda. Joanna, I want to thank you for being a volunteer. It's so great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's such a great place to be. The staff is wonderful. They, they are so appreciative of what we do and it is really a rewarding experience. And Liz, I want to thank you for being part of the team and for helping uh, give up an evening here and, and do this with us. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> thank you. It's great. So I really appreciate it. And Rebecca, good to see you in Nova Scotia. I hope you're well. Hang in there. We miss you. Uh, Amanda, thank you for being our co-pilot. Uh, thank you all for coming. Next week, Roxborough's Water and History. Hope to see you again next week. Uh, and stay tuned for further events like this. So thank you, everybody. And thank you for the clinic. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs>